Yes. Just this. Oh, you're trying to run it. Okay. Yeah. Okay, great. Okay. Shortly after arriving as the new curator of African art at the Newark Museum in 2002, I began the process of familiarizing myself with its extensive collections. Guided by a database generated list, I worked my way through the department's holdings by country and date of acquisition. At some point, I came across a collection of some 60 works from South Africa in the basement storage room. It was a seemingly random assortment, small bits of beadwork, painted ceramic cups, woven grass hats, even a mud brick in a lidded jar filled with clay. Some had small handwritten tags attached, the neat penmanship marking them as gifts and recording names, dates, and places. This was unusual given typical Western collecting practices where objects from Africa are presumed anonymous and provenance is murky at best. Curious to know more, I consulted the museum's records, which showed that these works were donated in 1947 by Lida C. Bronner of 514 Third Street in Newark, New Jersey. A slim folder of correspondence related to the acquisition described the donor as an African-American woman who collected them while traveling in South Africa in 1938. It also revealed that the collection had been exhibited at the museum in 1943. I was intrigued. Who was Lida C. Broner? Why did she go to South Africa? Who gave Broner these objects and what did the gifts mean to them and to her? What were her experiences as a black woman traveling in segregated South Africa on the eve of the Second World War? And how did her collection end up on view and then in storage at the Newark Museum? The museum's database yielded no answers to these questions. In an old filing cabinet in the registrar's department, I dug up an obsolete set of typewritten accession cards that offered a few additional clues. The cards provided visual descriptions and snippets of provenance. A woman from Johannesburg identified as Mother Masoli apparently gave Broner this ceramic vessel in October 1938. The beaded gourd container was a gift from Mrs. Bakway of Middle Drift in the Eastern Cape in December 1938. The cards classified works by geography and by genre, but the story behind Broner's collection was frustratingly incomplete. And with so little to go on, my investigation ground to a halt. And then out of the blue, in March of 2014, I received a call from Thomas Clanton, who introduced himself as Lida Clanton Broner's grandson and asked whether the museum still had his grandmother's collection. As it happened, Tom worked in Newark, less than a mile from the museum and his brother David also lived in New Jersey. The three of us met, objects were brought out from storage and Tom and Dave carefully handled each one, marveling at their grandmother's life. They had been close to her because from the early fifties on, she lived in the family house in Newark. Grandma loved Africa, Tom remarked to me that day. The first of many times he would re recall the lasting bond that Broner formed with the continent during her brief brief but impactful journey. Two months later, the Clanton brothers returned to the museum, much to my astonishment with an unexpected gift, their grandmother's archive of their 1938 journey to South Africa. There were an additional 90 objects, including strands upon strands of beadwork adornments and samples of needlework mounted on cardboard, each with Broner's own handwritten tags attached. The bountiful trove also included a travel journal detailing her everyday experiences, two photo albums filled with snapshots she took on her trips, and photographs presented as keepsakes by South African friends, a scrapbook that Broner made with newspaper clippings and other mementos from her time in South Africa, and about the display of her collection back in the United States, a large map with notations tracking her route by sea a handful of books and pamphlets about South African life, along with some souvenir postcards, and piles and piles of letters that traced her greetings and conversations with South African friends from the mid 1930s until her death in 1982. I opened the yellow page, yellowed pages of Broner's journal and read its epigraph, penned in the elegant script that I would come to know so well. After 28 years of desire and determination, I have visited Africa, the land of my forefathers, she wrote, adding as her signature, Lida Nolande Broner. 
In the months, indeed years, that followed, I have immersed myself in this remarkable journey of Lida Clanton Broner through this rich personal archive, which not only brought her travels to life, but gave new meaning to the original group of objects she gave to the museum nearly 70 years earlier. My book reconstructs the backstory and biography of Lida Broner's collection, introducing us to an ordinary woman from Newark whose life was in fact extraordinary, a woman I have come to call the activist collector. Lida Broner was born in 1895 in nearby Raleigh and relocated to New Jersey as a child with her family, eventually settling in Newark. Her desire to travel to Africa was sparked by tales of her grandparents who were enslaved Africans brought to the United States. For decades, she saved her earnings working as a housekeeper to realize her lifelong ambition. Its fulfillment began with a happenstance personal connection. In 1933, Broner welcomed into her home a young woman from South Africa who had come to the US through the transatlantic networks of the Baptist church to further her education. 20-year-old Rilda Marta was from the Eastern Cape and part of an emergent middle class of educated English-speaking Christians. These self-styled new Africans, in quotes, presented themselves as models of respectability and exemplars of progress committed to uplifting the race. Marta's year-long stay not only gave Broner a vital bridge to the continent of her ancestors, but sparked a growing diaspora consciousness shaped by shared ideas about racial uplift. Following Marta's return to South Africa, Broner's much anticipated personal pilgrimage gained greater purpose. In 1935, she enrolled at Apex School of Scientific Beauty Culture in Newark. It was a smart career decision that offered the financial resources to get her to Africa and a portable skill, hairstyling, that could generate income while she was there. The autonomy enjoy, enjoyed by beauty culturalists, as they called themselves, fostered an activist culture. Black beauty entrepreneurs and their clients came together within the safe space of the salon, combining the intimate work of hairstyling with talk of social and political change. Broner's growing activism was furthered through her involvement in the Black Women's Club movement. Around the same time that she graduated from Apex Beauty School, she founded the Lit Muse Club to, quote, improve the status of Native Africans. The club, composed of 14 similarly mind, internationally minded friends from Broner's Church, belonged to a nationwide network of thousands of other Black women's clubs dedicated to social reform and racial advancement. They afforded Black women who were largely excluded from clubs formed by white women the necessary organizational skills and networks to affect social and political change. By the end of 1936, in the aftermath of Italy's invasion of Ethiopia, Broner sought to connect the work of the Lit Muse Club to a larger, more explicitly political platform. She reached out to Max Jurgen, an African-American missionary and activist who had recently returned from South Africa to lead the newly founded International Committee on African Affairs in New York. The organization later known as the Council for African Affairs emerged in the 19, early 1940s as the leading pan-Africanist and anti-imperialist force in the struggle for African independence and especially for South African liberation. Broner became deeply involved in the work of the Council on African Affairs from its very start. In fact, she hosted what I believe was its first public meeting at her Newark home in August of 1937. The photograph here shows her with one of the council's founding members, Davidson Dantengu Jababu, known as DDT, a prominent South African political leader and professor at the University of Fort Hare, who was visiting the US and became a close friend of Broner's. Through the efforts of both Jurgen and Jababu, Broner was able to secure a visa to travel to South Africa. In May, 1938, just shy of 43 years old, she embarked on an ambitious journey by sea with the goal, as she put it, to study the conditions of the Negro in South Africa in order to draw attention to the segregationist policies of the era. It turned out that the collection she assembled during her nine month journey was part of this plan.
Groner arrived in East London, South Africa on June 21st, 1938. Over the next seven months, she covered some 2,000 miles throughout all four provinces of the Union of South Africa, as well as the British Protectorate of Basutu land, now known as Lesotho. She traveled mostly by train, routinely experiencing racism. She financed her ongoing travels by selling hair products and, as she would say, doing hair. Her sojourn coincided with a key moment of Black political awakening in South Africa, following the 1936 passage of the segregationist Herzog bills. The legislation restricted the rights of Blacks on virtually every, every level, including voting, education, land ownership, and, and residency, forming the foundation for the establishment of apartheid in 1948. These were issues that Broner learned about firsthand as she toured the country following an itinerary facilitated by mission-educated Black South Africans. Guided by this network, she experienced the spectrum of Black life in urban townships and rural reserves. Beyond participating in the mundane rituals of everyday existence, she visited mines, hospitals, and farms, and she attended church weddings, Zulu dances, and a Kosa initiation ceremony. She chronicled her experiences nearly every day in her diary, preserved news clippings and other mementos in a scrapbook, and took snaps, as she called them, of friends and acquaintances she met along the way, providing an extraordinary record of her travels. Broner's itinerary and ultimately her collection was shaped in important ways by this influential network of new Africans who preached the importance of education and respectability in their commitment to racial uplift. At least 30 of the people she met were profiled in the 1930 publication, The African Yearly Register by Mwele Skota, the go-to catalog of leading blacks across the continent, a copy of which Broner owned. In addition to DDT Jababu, they included prominent male political leaders and intellectuals, such as the American educated John Langa Libalele Dube, the founding president of African National Congress, and two of the organization's future presidents, Alfred Bettini Zuma and James Maroka, as well as the prominent Dr. Roseberry Bakwe. At the heart of Broner's network, however, were women, few of whom graced the pages of Skota's yearly register. They were women whose activism was less publicly visible or simply overlooked, but who were no less politically and socially engaged. Some of these women have been the subject of recent study, including DDT's wife, Florence Jababu, and the pioneering social worker, Sibu Sisiwe Makanya. Most, however, like Hilda Godlow, have yet to be written into history. Over the course of her travels, Broner would become well acquainted with the social and political concerns of this black middle class and develop an intimate understanding of their lives. Her itinerary was as much about knowledge sharing as it was about knowledge seeking. She was the guest of honor at intimate gatherings hosted in urban homes and on rural crawls, at large assemblies held at social centers, and on tours of numerous educational institutions from elementary schools to colleges. By her own account, she spoke on no less than 50 occasions sharing a message of race, pride, and unity with her South African hosts. Many of these events were significant enough to warrant newspaper coverage, in which remarks by this Negro beauty specialist, as she was referred to, were routinely described as inspiring. She lectured at the University of Fort Hare, influential for its role in educating Blacks from across Sub-Saharan Africa, including many future presidents. She spoke at Healdtown Institute, where Nelson Mandela was in his first semester at the time. Women's clubs were especially essential forums for sharing ideas about racial uplift and advancement. For Broner, these were all occasions that afforded her opportunities to begin and develop her collection. Whether visiting schools or hospitals, attending gatherings in private homes, or being feted at public receptions, she became increasingly in demand for her speeches, and she was regularly given works in exchange for them. During her seven months in South Africa, Broner acquired some 150 objects. She collected purposefully 
with the intention of public exhibition, though without any overarching organizational or representational framework. Instead, she relied on personal connections and contingent encounters as she traveled, forming a community gener generated sampling of native handcraft. These are everyday objects ranging in scope from beaded necklaces and painted clay vessels to embroidered doilies and wooden utensils. The vast majority of objects were given in Broner to show in America. Well over a hundred works were given by women, the greater part by far. More than souvenirs, they were objects of belonging that affirmed diasporic ties, the act of gifting itself expressing solidarity. For each work, Broner typically recorded the date and place she acquired it, and often the name of the maker and or donor as well. The collection is thus a material archive of transnational relationships, documenting moments in time and specific social encounters. Thanks to this detailed information, we meet more directly the cultural, social, and political worlds that Africans, especially women, were navigating in segregated South Africa. Collectively, the works speak to an era of momentous social and political change. For example, beadwork. Broner acquired nearly 50 examples, the greatest emphasis within the overall collection. While beadwork was seen as traditional and a marker of ethnic identity, as an artistic practice, it was established in and enabled by the colonial era. The glass beads were imported from Europe and became plentiful from the mid 19th century on through trade. The significant increase in beadwork production and accompanying development of so-called tribal style only came about with the advent of a cash economy fueled by the migrant labor of black men. Broner collected several examples of necklaces given to her by young women she described as Zulu maidens, whom, whom she visited while she was in Natal. She photographed them dancing for her and proudly wearing their beaded necklaces. Other beadwork was given to her by her mission educated hosts, who surely regarded the making and wearing of beadwork as a heathen practice. Nonetheless, the beadwork items were gifted to Broner as emblems of tradition and pride and heritage. This includes the beaded gourd container given by Irene Bakwe that I described encountering at the beginning. Bakwe, the wife of a prominent doctor on the Eastern Cape, offered it to Broner to mark a formal alliance forged between their respective women's organizations in December 1938. The numerous examples of pottery collected by Broner reflect contemporary changes in patronage and artistic practice. Again, returning to the other work I began with, the cup on the left uh, from Mother Masoli was likely from the mother of Mrs. R. E. Masoli, who gifted Broner the vessel to the right, seen here. The younger Masoli ran a successful grocery store in Brockpon a mining town east of Johannesburg and hosted Broner at a women's meeting where Broner's organizing advice was eagerly sought. Such earthenware vessels were historically made by South Sutu women as vehicles of spiritual communication. The chalice-like forms here on the right introduced in the late 19th century may reflect missionary influence. By the 1920s, such vessels were commonly sold at native craft fairs organized by mission stations and other church-related organizations as outreach to local communities. It's unlikely that either vessel was made by the Masolis themselves, but rather presented to Broner as examples of native craft and distanced from their original context. Broner was given about 20 examples of needlework a material manifestation of the Western domestic ideology being promoted through mission education. As part of their conversion to Christianity, women were taught various forms of needlework and encouraged to wear Western style clothing as evidence that they were civilized and modern. A far less elevated goal was fostering practical skills that serve the developing colonial economy by preparing domestic servants to work in white households. Among the most poignant of all the things Broner acquired are gifts from the young women of the Helping Hand Club, a hostel and domestic training school for African women in Johannesburg that was established in 1919. While staying there for several weeks, Broner taught them how to care for and style their hair and shared details about her club work. 
Their ease, even eagerness, as they posed for Broner's camera conveys the warmth and familiarity of their relationship. On her last day in Johannesburg, Broner wrote in her diary, girls in the hostel were very sorry to see me go. Many gave me things to show in America. Thanks to Broner's tags, we know the makers. Tracing these names in the archives of the Helping Hand offers a window onto their lives. 20-year-old Florence Mahambi, for example, who made the crocheted mat you see here, arrived at, a ho at the hostel a few weeks before Broner, having completed the equivalent of eighth grade. Described by the superintendent as a, quote, very intelligent Shangun girl, she had to support her own training since her father was a bad payer and ended up working locally for Mrs. Green. 19-year-old Dorcas Magato, the maker of the knitted cap here on the right, presents a sadder situation. She was a mission-educated petty girl from Petersburg who was reported to be, quote, very good in school and intelligent. She went to work at age 19 for a Mrs. Regan, who first notes that she is excellent and then later, not so good. Records explain how Magato gets in trouble with a boy and quote, changes jobs, and then dies of venereal disease in 1941. The contrast between the aspirations embodied in these humble objects, presented to Broner as examples of domestic respectability to show across the Atlantic, and what we know of the fortunes of their makers bound for service in white households, points to the ambiguities in many of the things that Lida Broner brought home. Many of the works in Broner's collection embody tensions surrounding contemporary political and cultural debates in South Africa about the role of tradition in an era of emerging African nationalism. For example, while in Alice in the Eastern Cape, Broner commissioned a traditional women's skirt and wrap from Nongendu Mahambi, recording it simply as native dress. But Broner's skirt reflects 20th century innovations. White cotton blankets dyed with ochre and decorated with imported black braiding and beads had replaced the original leather skirts. And by the 1930s, the traditional style Kosa dress had taken on a more complex meaning in the area through its adoption by members of the African Women's Self-Improvement Association. The organization founded by Florence Jababu was run by educated black elites who taught rural women practical domestic skills. All the women in the association were encouraged to wear a standardized traditional style Kosa dress in order to downplay class and ethnic differences. The dress symbolized a universal Kosa identity, an ethnic label actually encompassing several different groups, and by extension, a united sense of purpose in the name of progress. The skirt and wrap were among the 150 works that Brona returned home with, along with firsthand knowledge of segregated South Africa in February of 1939. Crossing this, the Atlantic, this collection of native handcraft was layered with new meanings and association, associations when mobilized by Broner on behalf of her activist mission. She became increasingly involved in the anti-colonialist work of the Council for African Affairs, establishing a Women's International Affairs Club as an auxiliary to the council shortly after returning. Although the club only had four members in its inaugural year and indeed through much of its existence, its agenda was ambitious. Transatlantic networks of exchange, exchange of institutions, individuals and ideas were central to its work. It had formal alliances with several South African organizations, including the male led explicitly political All African Convention as well as women's organizations, including the Daughters of Africa and Zenzele. Though small in size and in scale, Broner's Women's Club used their platform to draw media attention to South Africa, including through a series of activist exhibitions. The first public presentation of Broner's South African collection was April, 1939. It was held on a Sunday afternoon at the Sojourner Truth branch of the YWCA in Newark. The institutional context, a so-called colored branch of the YWCA, as opposed to a museum, is not surprising. 
for African Americans, exhibitions in non traditional spaces were born of necessity in the Jim Crow era. From the first decade of the 20th century, the so called colored branches of the YMCA and YWCA, along with other civic institutions, played a prominent role in the cultural life of Black communities. They offered a space for African Americans to stage exhibitions, as well as educational programs, lectures, and concerts. YWCAs, along with other community centers, were especially important sites of gathering and exchange as racial segregation intensified throughout the 1930s. And they would be almost exclusively the venues for public presentation of Broner's collection in the years to come, with the noteworthy exception of the Newark Museum in 1943. While there is no visual documentation of the display of Broner's collection, the exhibition was significant enough to warrant advanced publicity in local newspapers. She saved three clippings, which together provide our only record. According to one, the exhibition was composed of, quote, gifts from interested Africans, many of whom were educated in America. It went on to describe the, quote, most interesting part as the beautiful beadwork, basket weaving, clay pottery, and skin blankets made by primitive people commonly called heathens. The presentation was further enlivened by recordings of African music and folk tales, which Broner had also collected along the way. Of particular note and highlighted in the headline of the news article was the appearance and participation of Broner herself, who related her experiences as a feature of the exhibition wearing her African dress. Broner's exhibition is noteworthy in its content, method of presentation, and activist message. Its focus on examples of needlework, beadwork, basketry, and pottery from South Africa was distinct from the figurative sculpture more typically displayed as African art. Moreover, these objects were not from a timeless past, but rather gifts from interested Africans, representing the cultural present and social relationships formed with individuals over the course of her travels. Broner's lived experience and transatlantic bonds were central, not only to the content, but to the creation of the exhibition, which was personal and experiential in its execution. The objects were not silent witnesses to an unknowable past, but activated through music, words, and especially Broner's physical presence within the intimate space of the exhibition, which offered a live connection to the works on display. Broner's decision to wear African attire was a powerful affirmation of the significance of culture and its ongoing relevance to collective identity. Show your culture in things that are African, she had urged the audience during her last major public speech in South Africa. These are the things that keep up a nation. In Newark, in this context and to this audience, it conveyed a message of black pride and pan-African unity. Broner's deployment of African dress as a practice of cultural nationalism had precedent. Her friend, Sibu Sisi Makanya, similarly had worn Zulu attire on a lecture tour in the United States a decade earlier. And later, in 1962, Nelson Mandela would memorably dress in traditional Kosa cloak and beaded necklace for the court hearing that led to his sentencing and imprisonment. As he later described, quote, I had chosen traditional dress to emphasize the symbolism that I was a black African walking into a white man's court. I was literally carrying on my back the history, culture, and heritage of my people. That day, I felt myself to be the embodiment of African nationalism, the inheritor of Africa's difficult but noble past and her uncertain future. As an African American, Broner's self-presentation was also a public enactment of her newly solidified diasporic identity. At some point soon after her return, she went to Columbus studio on Bloomfield Avenue in Newark, just around the corner from her home to have her photograph taken in her African attire. In the resulting full length portrait, she stands in profile against a studio backdrop, barefoot and gazing contemplatively downward at a beaded pipe she holds in her hand. She's dressed in the long skirt and shoulder wrap made for her and Alice by Nungendu Mahambi, and she wears the pair of beaded headbands she acquired in Natal. Since her return, Broner had also taken on the Zulu name she had been given, No Lanle, or Mother of the Oceans, as her middle name. And sometime after the spring thaw, she had planted maize seeds that she gathered in South Africa in the soil of her Newark backyard. 
Her grandsons later recalled how proud she was of the corn she grew, the tall stalks a living, thriving testament to the roots she had grown in the land of her forefathers. Now in the space of the exhibition, wearing her flowing ochre dyed dress and adorned with layers of beadwork, Broner's embodiment of an African identity similarly collapsed cultural distance, challenging notions of a faraway primitive Africa. Her physical presence and playing of South African music established a performative context that would be fundamental to subsequent displays of her collection. While the material culture at the heart of the exhibition may not have been po explicitly political, Broner's agenda was. She shaped the interpretation of the exhibition by sharing firsthand knowledge of the quote, conditions under which the natives of South Africa lived. That the event was conceived by the Lit Muse Club as a fundraiser for the Council on African Affairs corroborates its activist agenda. Media coverage highlighted the club's affiliation with the CAA and its alignment with the work of South Africa's All African Convention. Similar exhibitions were mounted by Broner in the years that followed at libraries and community centers. They were formalized as part of the Council on African Affairs educational work in January 1942, when Broner joined their executive board, which was led by Paul Robeson and W.E.B. Du Bois. These displays soon caught the attention of Newark Museum director Beatrice Windsor. The Newark Museum had been founded in 1909 with the progressive, not to say radical, agenda. While time precludes a longer history, important here is its community focus and broad definition of art. Its goal was to bring good design and cultural literacy, both defined globally, to members of its diverse, mostly immigrant city. Quote, the goodness of a museum is not in direct ratio to the cost of its building and the upkeep or to the rarity, auction value, or money cost of its collections. A museum is good only insofar as it is of use, said its founder, John Cotton Dana. At the time, the museum was organizing a series of exhibitions entitled Native Peoples in the Theaters of War, which debuted in December 1942. The series was intended to give audiences a sense of life in remote parts of the world involved in the war through displays of their material culture. Interpretive strategies made explicit the connection between the works on display and global politics, including references to the plight of colonized people and nascent struggles for independence. Although the South African nation was not technically part of the theaters of war, Windsor decided that a display of native arts and crafts representative of contemporary black South African life was well suited to the museum's programming on global politics. In May 1943, the Newark Museum presented Broner's collection, accompanied by a lecture by Max Jurgen, the council's executive director on the topic of Africa and New World relations. Broner wore her COSA dress and played recording of South African music at its opening. In an accompanying interview with the Newark News, Broner shared her observations about South Africa. I was particularly impressed by the likeness of the American and African Negro. Only here we have free and compulsory education, whereas they must pay for their education and that limits them. They have the same desires and ambitions as others and there are strong and able leaders among them. It is significant that the article focuses as much as anything on social and economic conditions for blacks in South Africa, a sure measure of success on Broner's part in promoting the work of the CAA through the display of her collection. In 1947, Broner decided to donate works from her collection to the Newark Museum, choosing some 80 objects. The process of accessioning reveals frictions between the collection's rich, richly layered experiences and subjective values and the museum's normative categories and standards of quality. Departing director Beatrice Windsor thanked Broner for the, quote, very interesting and valuable collection of South African material. However, her successor, Alice Kendall, after reviewing the collection, wrote to Broner that there were, quote, a few pieces that are, in a sense, duplicates of other items in the collection, and a few pieces which do not seem strictly of museum quality. 20 objects were returned to Broner. 
Like most private collections given to museums, the personal threads that connected one object to another and the collection to owner were overridden, if not severed by institutional priorities and procedures. Works defined as redundant and of lesser quality were returned to Broner and those that were accepted by the museum were duly classified according to conventional museum standards and stored according to type of object. The tags with their handwritten notes documenting the circumstances of their collection were removed, detaching the works from any kind of historic and cultural context and were replaced with accession numbers. Museum registrars recorded Broner's notes, including names and dates on the backside of index cards but the front was reserved for the standard cataloging criteria. Object, country, size, description. This is the information that was eventually recorded in the museum's database <clears throat> when these cards were transcribed and computerized beginning in the 1990s. For much of the past 70 years, the collection has largely lay in storage. Museum practices of classifications had transformed them into object types and representative examples of ethnic styles. Judged by such standards, the objects themselves seemed rather ordinary. Some were more like tourist trinkets than items typically found in art museum collections. Lack of contextual information about the intellectual environment informing the collection rendered them museal or museum-like as German philosopher Theodore Adorno describes such objects that no longer carry meaning for the visitor and as such are in the process of dying. Museum objects, he writes, stripped of the personal narratives that their previous owners ascribed them, occupy a twilight world ordered by rules of institutionalized knowledge. The Broner collection remained in this twilight world well into the 21st century. In the book, I used the term the activist collector to describe Lyda Clanton Broner because she assembled this group of objects to do something, to be mobilized on behalf of a larger cause. They ended up at a museum whose founding director, John Cotton Dana, believed the worth of a museum is in its use. And yet for decades, Broner's collection remained sequestered away and the story of her activism was unknown even to her grandchildren who just knew that she loved Africa. In the same way that Broner's grassroots organizing connected her to other people, places, and ideas, this modest group of gifts to show in America connects us to a much richer story than any collection of representative regions or object types ever could. They are useful objects, but in a greater sense than Broner or gift givers intended, for they allow us not only to reach into that past, but to contemplate their relevance in the present day. The conditions of their making, the forces and networks that brought them together, and the motivations for mobilizing them as a collection reverberate in current debates about cultural representation, the role of heritage and whose voices are recorded, particularly in relation to identity, and are echoed in ongoing struggles for racial and gender equity. This then is the archival potential of Lida Clanton Broner's collection and ultimately why her story matters. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kristen. So we are open um, for questions from the audience. 